Hi, we're back with another Fine Scale Modeler Weekly. And that means looking at new kits. So let's jump straight in with an updated kit from Hobby Boss. A 135th scale GAZ AAA with Quad Maxim AA gun. The GAZ AA was a license built for AA. The AAA model added a second rear axle, creating a 4x6 truck and giving it greater overland mobility. The vehicle was widely used by the Soviet Army during World War II. Sitting on long, thin frame rails, the distinctive Ford cab comprises the seat, firewall, doors, hood, and cowl, back wall and roof, radiator and engine side panels, and the fenders. New here, as opposed to Hobby Boss's original gas AAA kit, are parts for the cargo bed, including the wooden sides, the mount for the machine guns, and the ammunition for them. Each gun is a single crisply molded part with bracket and base, ammunition boxes, and other fine details. Underneath is a finely detailed engine, suspension with springs, axles, and differentials, wheels with brake details, and rubber tires with embossed sidewall placards. There's a photo etch brass fret, but most of the parts aren't used here, with the exception of the wiper and the emblem for the radiator. Clear plastic supplies the cab windows and headlights, and pre-cut masks are included. A small decal sheet gives two marking options, an overall dark green truck with red stars and white cereals, and a similarly marked vehicle in winter whitewash. The combination of the older truck with the Quad Maxim machine gun mount has always been appealing, and this kit looks to capture it well. Next, another mini craft kit from Academy. The 172nd scale PBM 5A Mariner landed in stores in 2013 and it was reissued a couple times as the PBM 5, the non-amphibious version of the flying boat. This one remains largely unchanged from the original release, including the same marking options. Surface detail on airframe parts like the fuselage and wings is fine recessed panel lines. Control surfaces are separate and designed to be movable. Inside, the cockpit and crew sections have seats, controls, instrument panel, engineering, radio, and search stations. There's also detail in the turrets, the weapon bays in the engine nacelles, and the landing gear bays. To push the optional props, multi-part engines fit inside the cowls with optional cooling flaps. Between the windshield, turrets, cabin windows, and lights, the Mariner has lots of clear parts. And the kit supplies pre-cut masks for painting. The marking options are the same as those in the original Minicraft release. In his 2013 Workbench review, Paul Boyer says that one is the XPBM 5A, a conversion of the Dash 5 flying boat. The one in the earlier markings doesn't match any known PBM serial, he noted. You can read Paul's review at the link in the description. It's a nice kit with lots of options. Round 2 continues its trend of reproducing classic kits with all new tooling. One of the most recent is a 125th scale 1960 Ford F100 pickup. Issued in 1960 and updated for 1961, it appears the original kit has never been re-released. The well-molded body shows nicely defined accent creases, door outlines, and windows. The tailgate with the embossed lettering and straps for the latches is molded with the body of the bed. The separate hood covers the detailed Tri-Power V8 power plant with chrome valve covers and carbs. Other plated parts include optional wheels, hubcaps, poverty caps, front grill, bumpers, badging, mirrors, and custom exhausts. The tub interior gets a bench seat, dashboard, and controls. The bed floor and wheel arches fit in from underneath. A tonneau cover and custom rear wheel arch covers are included. Everything sits on a one-piece underside molded with the frame, drive shaft, and front and rear suspension. White plastic wheels are included as an option, and there are white wall vinyl tires. As a bonus, the kit includes a trailer with frame, tread plate inserts, ramps, axle with springs and a hitch, and side panels. Clear plastic supplies the windshield and rear glass as separate parts as well as headlights. Clear red is used for stock and custom taillights and a flasher dome for the service truck option. Decals give instrument cluster dials, stripes for the service truck push bumper, a couple of service truck liveries, including golf, and custom striping. This is a neat kit of a truck you can't find except on the collector market. And you'll pay big bucks for it there. Edward has been making great hay with its 148 scale Zero kits. If you like Mitsubishi's fighter, check out the A6 M3 Zero Type 32 Weekend Edition. We looked at the initial release of this kit in a previous video, and you can find a link to that in the description. 
Typical of weekend edition kits, this one has all of the Profipak's plastic parts, including the clipped wings and detailed engine, but lacks the photo etched metal and masts. It still has a good selection of marking options on the decal sheet with five aircraft, including an overall gray fighter from Tainan Kokutai at Buna, New Guinea, August 1942, another overall gray aircraft from Kokutai 204 at Buin in the Solomons in January 1943, a fighter wearing field applied green camo flown by Warrant Officer Matsuo Hagiri at Rabaul, New Britain in July 1943. Another in field applied camouflage from Raburu Kukubuntai at Rabaul in August 1943. And the same plane with modified markings at Belal Airfield in the Solomons in October 1943. Another variant of the Zero tackled by Edward is the A6M2N roof. We looked at the initial kit, a dual combo, in a previous video. You can find that at a link in the description also. That aircraft is back in a straight Profipak kit with a single aircraft in the box. The plastic is exactly the same as the dual combo kit with the caveat that you get half as much and the photo etched metal and masks are here. Five options are provided on the decals, none repeated from the previous release. They include a field camouflaged aircraft with Kokutai 452 at Kiska Island and the Aleutians in early 1943, an overall gray fighter from the seaplane tender Kamakawa Maru in September 1943, another roof wearing field applied camo with the Kokutai 802 in the Shortland Islands in February 1943, a fighter with badly worn green camo serving with Takuma Kokutai in Japan 1944, and one of the float planes wearing factory applied green camouflage at Kashima Base in Japan, 1944. Zero fans have to be like, dang, Edward, you're doing some nice work. Look for reviews of the Gaz and F100 at finescale.com. Your one stop shop for videos, reviews, and inspirational galleries from readers and shows. Check it out today. Fine Scale Modeler Weekly, brought to you by Hobby Zone USA, your source for hobby storage solutions, hard to find hobby tools, and aftermarket modeling needs. Does this look familiar? It should. Two episodes ago, I talked to you about my air compressor and the tank that came with it and the things I liked about it, the things that I look for in an air compressor. However, I did not talk to you about draining the tank necessarily. Um, and that was a mistake on my part. So there were a number of you who came in and were commenting about draining the the uh, holding tank for the compressor and the reasons to do it. And I admit, I really should have talked about that. So first of all, I did talk about taking the air or releasing the air out of the tank, right? The air pressure. And there are, as I said, three different ways to do that. You can do it at the hose, probably not the best. Through the uh, moisture trap, that works. Although, like I said, this little needle valve down here. Psh. Now, somebody pointed out in the comments that you could replace this with like a, 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 a cock valve. Um, okay, that's possible. But anyway, I haven't done that. And so that's what I use there. Or there is also the emergency safety valve. Now, some of you said, well, just go ahead and use the plug on the bottom of the tank. And while for larger air compressor tanks, like 20 gallons or more, where you might have some sort of needle valve or other valve that's designed specifically to do that, on little guys like this, I would not recommend doing it. And I'm gonna tell you why. Um, typically on the bottom of these is what's known as, and my ring is banging up against that, is what's known as, just, it's just a simple plug. So I'm gonna go ahead and flip this over and show you right here. It's just a simple plug that is screwed in there. Now, you're gonna notice that this sunk plug that I have there is brass and is not chrome like the original plug was. I'm gonna tell you why and why I don't recommend you using the plug on these things to release the air pressure out of the tank. Um, while you can do it and you can loosen it and you can get the air pressure to come out, if you loosen it too much, the air pressure is going to rush out all at once and it's very possibly going to hit that plug 
and make it go flying. And that actually happened to me. Um, the plug that originally came with this tank, I was draining it one day and I hadn't released all the air out like I normally do. And so I had it sitting like this and I had loosened it and it was releasing the air. Psss, it's coming out, not a problem. And I wasn't really paying attention and I loosened it too much. And as soon as it was too much, it shot that plug right out of my hand. Now, luckily, um, I didn't have the tank facing toward me, because that would have been bad. Even more luckily, I didn't have my daughter or someone else in the workshop with me while that happened, because it did shoot out of my hand like a bullet. Um, in fact, it was so loud when all that air came out in just one big bang that I didn't hear where the plug landed I did see the trajectory, or at least the perceived trajectory of the plug, but that plug is still somewhere in my workshop and I have yet to find it. So um, just as a measure of safety, I would not recommend letting the air out um, by loosening this plug. Let the air out either through the moisture trap, um, through the, uh, the safety valve. <clears throat> I don't really recommend doing it at the end of the hose either, but you could. So with that, why would we want to drain the tank? Well, as we talked about with the moisture trap, because we're compressing air into the tank, as soon as we do that, we are introducing moisture. Condensation will build up in the tank, and that means that there will be water in here over, over time. It's just going to build up. So you're going to want to drain the tank from time to time, so that you don't get a lot of rust on the inside. Now, there are, and you can go back to the other, the other video, there are the guys, and we talked about these guys. We're like, I drain, I, I decompress the tank, and I drain the tank every time, after every, every time I fire it up. Okay, and that's totally cool. If that is your method, that's fine. Um, the reason is, is that you don't want the inside of this tank to corrode. Do I drain this tank after every time I use it? I do not. Um, but once a month is probably about what I do. Um, how often you would do it would also depend on the humidity of your area. If you're in Arizona, you're probably not seeing a heck of a lot of moisture in this moisture trap. And if you're not, there's probably not a lot of moisture in here, so you're not gonna really necessarily need to drain the tank as often. Um, if you're living in Florida or somewhere else that's really humid in the South or maybe in the Northeast or out in the Pacific, somewhere where there is a lot of humidity, you're probably going to wanna think about draining the tank more often, especially pro probably because you're going to be seeing more moisture in this moisture trap. So, Draining the tank, how do we do that? Right here is the plug. Um, and as I said, this is a replacement plug, a brass one that I installed after I lost my original plug that came with it. You can see that I've scarred up my, my uh, powder coat there from using a, a wrench previously to, to loosen the plug in any case. So what you wanna do is you wanna remove this plug. Now, under normal circumstances. I would not remove the plug with the whole apparatus being upside down, but so that you guys can see what we're doing. Um, my plug now takes a five millimeter hex wrench. So what you wanna do is you just wanna loosen the plug, take that out, and then you're gonna see that you've got this opening. Now, you're gonna wanna do this over the top of a towel or a paper towel or you know, something that's going to soak up moisture. And then go ahead and just turn it over. Now, mine is pretty much empty, but what will happen is then moisture will come out from this little spout down there. It'll come flowing out. If I were to have this under pressure and I loosen that plug, it would start to, it would release air and it would spit water. 
Here's the thing about just letting it spit water. Um, while it'll do that for a while, eventually all the pressure comes out and it's not going to get all of that condensate out of the inside of this tank. So what you wanna do is then rock the tank back and forth and just basically try to slosh any other, any other water that might be in there toward this, toward this hole to make sure that you get as much of the condensate out. Now, with other larger tanks <clears throat> that are oftentimes positioned so that you've got the, the valve at the back end so that the, the water will flow toward the back and then when you release it, a lot of that water comes out. Or they're stood up vertically and then the valve is down here at one end and then all that water collects. And so it's just specifically designed for that. With these little tanks, you're not going to get that. So what you need to do is you need to work at it a little bit and make sure that that water comes out. The next thing you wanna do then is go ahead and put your plug back in, tighten it all the way down, but you don't wanna crank on it super hard. You just wanna tighten it all the way down until it's no longer moving. Stand it back up and then plug it in, turn it on and see if the, if the compressor finally stops compressing air. If the compressor continues to compress air after you've let the water out, after you've drained this tank, that means that your plug isn't in tightly or there's something else wrong with the seal. You need to turn it off, unplug it, take all the air pressure out, and then go ahead and either reseat the plug and, or, just, or tighten it down a bit. Go back, turn it on again, and then, and then see if the compressor stops compressing. Once it does, you know that you've got a good seal and you can go back and start doing your work again. The only other thing is, and again, I can't reiterate this enough, is when you are taking the plug out, even if you're sure, you're certain that you've gotten all of the air out, make sure that you do not have this facing toward you or facing toward anyone else or something important in your workshop. Make sure that it's just, it's not because you wanna make sure that this plug doesn't go flying at somebody. I put the plug back in, now it's just testing it out to make sure that it's in tight. There it is. Do you like car models and want to be inspired? We've got you covered with Contest Cars 2023 available now. You can order your copy directly from ComebackHobbyStore.com or find it at your favorite hobby store, bookstore, or newsstand. If you're like me, figure modeling can be a bit bewildering, but we've got some help in the form of paint award-winning figures. This special issue features 11 projects from high caliber modelers like Matt Mrozik, Joe Hudson, Brian Wildfong, and the most recent winner of the Gumpla Builders World Cup, Simon Lamb. It goes on sale in March, but you can pre-order your copy today at ComebackHobbyStore.com. Do you like what you see here and want more? Subscribe to Fine Scale Modeler Magazine. You'll get six issues a year crammed with how-to stories from some of the best modelers around the world. Go to FineScale.com slash YouTube for a special offer for YouTube viewers like you. So Tim and I were talking about this the other day, and that is... The other day. The other day. Tim and I were talking about this the other day, and it's all about finding time to model. Now, Tim's stash is smaller than mine. Mine is... By a lot. It, like magnitude. It's, you know, uh, yeah, sure. Okay, we'll just go with that. <laughs> Mathematically, yes, it's magnitudes bigger than Tim's is. And every time I go down there, I'm like, 
excuse me? Every time I go down there to my basement where my stash is, I'm like going, man, there's some malls here I really want to build. Yeah. But then I look at it and I'm like going, I, I have got this started and this started. I need to finish one of those before I get on to the next one. But I always seem to find that I just don't have the time to do as much as modeling as I want to do. I have not gotten to my workbench at all in the last two weeks at home. Hmm. Um, just haven't had the time to do it with one thing or another going on. It happens. And uh, so I'm curious as to how people find time. I mean, I know you've been making some time to get to the workbench to work on the uh, the infamous Clydesdales. The Clydesdales. Um, I don't know. I think it's a hobby, right? And for some of us who do it for a living, I mean, you have to make your way to the workbench, right? Yes. I mean, if you're at the office and it's like you, you're on a deadline and you need to get this done, or somebody like Matt Mrazek, he's got a client who is waiting for for a figure, and he's, you know, when when you are, when your income is based on how quickly you can turn, it turns less from, you know, now it's not a hobby, it's a business. You can still love what you're doing, but you've got to turn, you've got to churn through it. I think when it's a hobby, um, you're you're under no pressure, except whatever you put on your on yourself, right. right? So I don't. It's supposed to be fun, and I think we've we've run into a number of of um, people who used to contribute uh, to Fine Scale, and who we've found over the years they don't actually do modeling anymore. They've moved on to other things. Right. They're, fishing or golf you know, or golf or, or whatever. So they've, you know, they've, they've fallen out of love with the hobby and then they've, they've gone on to other things. doesn't mean that they won't fall back into love with it, but they aren't doing it now. I think for me, you know, a big, a big thing that helps me is to make sure that I try and bring my daughter or my son into the workshop and having them there. That just means that I'm spending time with them. Right. Because otherwise, I would be spending time with my models and not with them. And as we've discussed, at least for me, you know, my my family, my wife and my kids come before everything, the modeling or career or whatever. Sure. And and that's obviously a balance, I think, for everybody who has, I mean, family, work, whatever your obligations are outside of your hobby. And it's just... I know that I, it's been a struggle lately to just get to the workbench and, and get some time. I love any time I get to be at the workbench, but it's getting past that the, initial... The, the mojo. The, right. The mojo thing that we, yes. we, we talk about sometimes. And I, I, we talked, I think, a little bit about this, you know, uh, a couple of a couple of uh, episodes ago. I, maybe we touched on the this a little bit. The discouragement thing. Yeah, yeah, the discouragement thing. Um. You know, uh, everybody goes through it. It's like, find, you know, you may have to find something else to do for a while. Or it's just, just go do that little thing. And, you know, I've got that one thing that I need to do. For me, what keeps me awake from the workbench is I start thinking too much about what it is that I'm about to do. So Clydesdales is a good example. Um, it's like, these painting these horses, guys. <laughs> Some of you are out there going, ah, horses ain't no thing. And I'm <laughs> I gotta tell you, I have gone down some serious rabbit holes trying to figure out how to paint these horses and do it successfully so that they look nice. And I've I've found that there is a whole community of mostly women, I think, who that's what they do is they paint the, I think the, the company's name is Briar. Mm -hmm. They make horses, model horses, and th that's the, there's a whole segment of our hobby, because it really, is, it's scale modeling. There's a whole segment of our hobby that I had no idea about, these Briar horses. And mostly women, and they're doing these phenomenal job. And I'm, so I'm studying, I'm studying, and I'm studying. And I'm doing a lot of experimentation, but I ain't getting a lot done on actually finishing the horses because I'm trying to do it right. I'm, and this is that that's that this is that internal pressure, right? Sure. This is the okay. I I want to do this right, 
this is my dad's model. I want to make, you know, he's, I want to do it right by him. This sort of platonic ideal that I've got somewhere in my head. And I'm not going to ever reach it, but it's like, okay, well, that was keeping me away from the word bench, right. you know? And I, I, you, I was telling, I was telling, I was having nightmares about these horses. <laughs> I was waking up in the middle of the night and had just the paint gone awry, the, the workshop on fire, all <laughs> sorts of stuff, just craziness. Um, but that it was. So over Christmas, where I was really hoping to get at the workbench, I was just like, every time I'd go down there and look at it, I'm like, oh, I need to do more studying. And so it was, what do we call it? Um, analysis paralysis. Yes. Yeah. And Overthinking I, it. And I think... For me, I think, and you, you touch on a point here that I've touched on, that I've thought about before with my modeling, is that there's this, you know, they talk about that uh, when you're running a marathon, there's that moment where you have to get past. Hitting the wall. Hitting the wall. It seems like every project I work on, I hit a wall where I just, I hit this moment and it's like, I don't know if I can pull this next step off successfully. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times when I finally do get to the point where I'm just gonna like, I'm going to, I'm going to plow through this. I'm going to get through it. It turns out to be easier than I expected it to be. Right. And if I could remember that from one moment to the next or one project to the next, right. I might actually not have that issue, but it's like, okay, I've got to mask this particular paint scheme, or I've yeah. got to do this little bit of, I've got to work with the photo etch. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, Something like that, and I just, I, I sort of seize up on myself, yeah. and that's when I get distracted by another project, or I build some Lego or something that's a little, it doesn't have that challenge to it. So. I think there, so for me, having the kids, that helps. Uh, like you say, trying to, trying to go, all right, let's just get that done, and it, finding out it's easier. The other thing is, is it, support from, from friends. Um, other people who are in the hobby with you. And I, I'll go back, what was it, two years now. Um, and that was where you and Chuck Davis were for me, where I was, I was really in some doldrums. I hadn't been doing any modeling at all. And I just, you know, I texted you guys, and I was like, I'm going to try and get this done. I'm going to sit down, and I'm going to do this. This is my time frame for getting it done started texting pictures and then suddenly here you come back with, you know, photos of this and Chuck was coming in with photos of what he was doing. And suddenly we had this little group build going and that, that got me back on the horse sure. to the point where from that point I've been consistently modeling ever since. And I think that was a bit, I mean, so anybody who can sort of develop that, even if it's just texting or via Facebook or, you know, private messaging or whatever to get that done. I think that's helpful too, right? Just having, you know, club meetings can be, can be a way to do that too. It's like a little bit of encouragement yeah, from exactly, just, particularly when you're doubting yourself, doubting your, how this is going to work and that sort of thing. Having somebody go, Oh, you know, you're doing a really good job with that. If you can, you know, why don't, or you might try this or I did this or something right, like that. And right. that might be just the information you need to get going. So yeah, I can see that working too. So how do you guys deal with not so much discouragement, right? Because we talked about that before, but it's that, how do you get your mojo back? How are you like, I'm, you, you find yourself avoiding the workbench, right? You, well, I got this thing to do, or I've got this thing to do. The rest of the family has gone to bed and it is now the perfect time for you to sit down at the workbench and instead you're watching Demon Slayer. Sure. <laughs> or, or Robotech, or or you know I don't know whatever the latest Netflix movie is, just, or Star Wars for the forty third time. Sure. You so instead of at the workbench, you're doing the other thing. How do you get past that? How do you get yourself back? Drop to the us workbench? a line. Yeah. If if you've got some ideas, drop us a line at editor at finescale dot com or, or put it in the comments below. On that note, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Next, another mini craft kit from Academy. I was not ready. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the PBM. <laughs> In his 2013 workbench review. Review. Oh. <laughs> yeah, you know, the comma and the M are right next to each other on the keyboard, it turns out. In his 2013 workbench. I, I was reading the review minute through me off. In his 2013 work, workbench review. <laughs> you can find that in a 
thingy bob down here, watch the non-amphibious version of the flying boat. But this, look, a couple, that, that was it. I was done. You're right. Two episodes ago, we talked about, does this look familiar? It should. Two episodes ago, <laughs> does this look familiar? It should, because two episodes ago, I talked, what are you laughing about now? <laughs> what are you laughing about now? Go home.